anybody can preach after that, right? <laughs> so so any, any volunteers, come up. Now is your time. So thank you, choir, uh, for that. Incredible. You know, that's a, that's a song that they sing every now and then and love it every single time. And I never remember that there's that extra part at the end, you know? I'm always with you. I'm so into it. I'm just like, yeah, praise the Lord. And then they do it again. I'm like, all right, praise the Lord again. So... That's great. Thank you guys so much for that. Isn't it? It's a, it's a blessing to have a choir um, these days, and it's a blessing to have a full choir. I mean, we're about to have to get some more chairs up there and, and uh, add, add some more. I know uh, Bo would not mind if some of y'all want to get up there and sing. Um, listen, he would even let me sing because there's so many good singers that they could just drown me out. And so um, even if you may think I don't, you don't have the strongest voice, that's all right. Get up there and and worship the Lord. Well, today we are uh, in Galatians and Galatians chapter 6. Uh, while you turn there, our, we're almost finished with Galatians. We've got this week and next week. And some of y'all are thinking, I didn't think we would ever get out of Galatians. But we are. We're about to finish up, uh, which means something new is coming down, uh, down the way. And so beginning in October, uh, the first Sunday in October, all the way through that first Sunday in November. So for five weeks, we're going to be doing a series called We God's People. And uh, it's going to be focused on 1 Peter 2, 9, which says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And as we prepare towards the general election on November 5th, there's a, politics is really taking center stage, and what's next for our country is going to take center stage. We're in one of those election cycles where we know that the next president will be somebody new, and that leaves people on both sides of the aisle a little uncertain and a little con uh, confused or wondering about what's coming up. And so what I want us to do in this series is really focus in on what God has for us as Christians, how we are supposed to live as citizens of an earthly country and, but even more importantly, primarily citizens of a heavenly kingdom and subjects of the King of Kings. And so we're going to look at that for five weeks. We're going to look at each one of those different descriptions that we have there in 1 Peter 2, 9 to decide what it means to be God's people. And so I hope that you'll join me uh, in that series. Um, you might want to wear your steel toe boots. We might step on some toes during that one, but that's all right, okay? Jesus liked to step on toes, and so I'll just try to step on them graciously like he did. Well, we're in Galatians chapter 6 today as we do this um, next to the last part, this kind of middle section here in this chapter, Galatians chapter 6, and um, Paul is wrapping up in his letter, and in this section, um, he's, he's focused on the mutual love and care uh, between fellow believers. Now, this is a pretty common topic for Paul to wrap up a letter with. He he often comes to this subject about loving one another and stuff like that. It's a pretty common topic, but as we'll see next week, the overall conclusion of the letter of Galatians is anything but typical uh, for the Apostle Paul. And so um, look forward to finishing that up next week, but let's go ahead and read Galatians 6, 6 through 10 together today. It says, Let the one who is taught the word share all his good things with the teacher. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap, because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. Lord God, we thank you this morning that uh, we had the opportunity to, to read your word, study it, to have it uh, just implanted into our lives today, Lord. I pray that you would just speak to us by the power of your spirit and by the fullness and completeness of your holy word. Lord, thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for the worship we've been able to share together. We pray that it was a sweet aroma, uh, just blessing the kingdom of heaven as it made its way to you. And so, Lord, we just pray this morning you would be blessed and you would in turn bless us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to jump right in this morning to our, our main point and then spend some time kind of putting some pillars of why underneath this main point. And so today, what I want us to understand is that Christians are called to love all people, but especially those within our Christian community, okay? And we're, we're called, and we'll look at some, a passage here in a moment, we're called to love everyone, right? To love everybody, whether they are a fellow believer or not a fellow believer in the church or outside the church. We're called to love everybody, but... There is an, a special call on us as believers to love those, care for those within the Christian community. 
And sometimes I think out of a desire to not appear selfish or in, too inwardly focused as a church, we major on loving outside the walls and we forget to love inside the walls and exactly what that means. But Jesus tells us, you know, we, we have these passages where, you know, Jesus tells us to love people outside the community. Like Matthew 5, 4, in Matthew 5, 44 and verse 46, it says, I tell you, love your enemies. Uh, this isn't on the screen, but it says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Verse 46 says, for if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? Now, in that context, we have to understand Jesus was not telling you, well, hey, don't worry about loving other you know, fellow believers. That's not what he's saying. He's saying if you only do that, then how are you any better than everybody else? Because everybody loves their own, right? He's saying you need to love those outside the community and love those inside the community. So Jesus does tell us to do both, right? But then as we get into Scripture and we continue to read, um, Jesus modeled that, but he also modeled love for those within the community of faith, right? And we have time and time again throughout Scripture in the sayings of Jesus and in the writings of the other apostles um, that we are to love one another. Have you ever heard that phrase? Love one another. And I've, I've got just a, a sampling of some different verses from the Scripture where we are commanded to love one another. A couple from Jesus. Jesus said in John 13, I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John 15, 12, this is my command, love one another as I have loved you. From the Apostle Paul, Romans 12, 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. 1 Thessalonians 3.12, may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow with love for one another and for everyone, just as we do for you. From Peter, 1 Peter 4.8, above all, maintain constant love for one another since love covers a multitude of sin. From the Apostle John, 1 John 3.23, now this is his command that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he commanded us. 1 John 4, 7, dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And probably the greatest verse on love in the scripture from the apostle Peter, 1 Peter 5, 14, greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all you who are in Christ. And so I think we should practice that one right now. Turn to your neighbor um, and just greet one another this morning in a holy way. All right. Now, I see some of y'all, I see some of y'all that are just kissing your spouse, and, and that doesn't count, okay? That doesn't count. All right, break it up, break it up. Get the Bible between you guys, okay? Well, while we don't want to diminish a truth found in Scripture simply, simply because it's less common, you know, we are commanded to, uh, to love other people. We have to see this repeated phrase, love one another, this repeated theme throughout Scripture. And anytime Scripture repeats something over and over and over again, it's wanting to make that point. And whenever you can read the same thing that Jesus commanded when he was with his disciples, you see that repeated by his disciples throughout their writings. You understand this had to be seen as an essential doctrine, an essential truth of the church. And so what I want us to answer today is this question of why distinguish between care inside and outside the church? Why are we saying specifically Christians are called to love all people, but especially those within our Christian community? I think we have four reasons that we can look at here in this passage of Scripture that Paul gives us. And so the first thing that we see this morning is that even leaders need encouragement and support. Why do, one of the reasons we need to care and one of the ways we need to care for those within our Christian community is to encourage and support our leaders. Now, this, uh, we see this here in Galatians 6.6, 6, let the one who has taught the word share all his good things with the teacher. Now, this is always a bit of an awkward verse to preach on for any pastor because it's basically saying, hey, make sure that you pay your staff, right? Yeah, it's kind of like the CFO of a company standing up at a board meeting asking for a raise. You know, it's just kind of, it's kind of an odd situation. Um, I had originally assigned this week to Jake, but I decided maybe the first time he got up here to preach shouldn't have been on, you know, pay your, pay your pastors kind of topic. Um, but, you know, aside from that, I just want to say this church is most definitely generous to your staff and uh, to all of us. We feel like we are loved and cared for and appreciate so much your generosity. 
Um, but, you know, this word share that is used here, it's also used elsewhere in the New Testament to describe that idea, that topic of generous giving. And good things, whenever that, that Greek word is used throughout Scripture, it usually refers to those things that are essential for life. Those things that are essential for somebody to be able to live a fulfilled and fruitful life. And so, um, like an example is Philippians 4.15 is where Paul says, You Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. He's praising them, thanking them for the way that they supported him in the ministry. If you've ever supported a uh, maybe a uh, itinerant evangelist, or maybe you've supported a missionary who's overseas or something like that, and every now and then, like once or twice a year, um, they send you a letter that says, hey, this is what's been going on. You know, this is what we've done this year. Thank you for your continued support. That's basically what Paul is saying here. He's saying, hey, Philippian church, thank you for your support as we have carried on the ministry um, uh, around the Roman Empire. And so I believe that, that this is referring to that, but this goes even beyond that idea of just monetarily supporting those who are uh, working within, you know, within our modern context, what we might call paid staff. I think this includes uh, the encouragement and uh, just the, the support and uh, care over all of those within our church that uh, lead and teach and um, uh, help this church function as an organized group of believers. You think about your Sunday school teacher. They put in lots of time every week to prepare those lessons so that they can help you to understand a little bit deeper about the Word so that they can be prepared and so that then you can be equipped. All the people that, stand, that serve on our uh, existing committees and uh, our ministry teams, you know, our administrative teams as well as our ministry-focused teams, those are, you are incredible, uh, give an incredible gift to our church. And um, that covers a lot of people. Listen, those people need encouragement. It can be discouraging at times serving in some of these leadership, uh, leadership roles. A leadership team, a ministry team is made up of people with different opinions. And um, it doesn't take long, you know, you, have, you don't have to be around the world very long to figure out that whenever you've got a group of people with varying opinions, some people's opinions have to uh, acquiesce to other people's at times, right? And so sometimes going to that meeting can be encouraging. Sometimes it can be a little discouraging. I am surprised how often I hear from a Sunday school teacher who doesn't feel like they are very good at what they do. They don't feel like they are equipped. They don't feel like they really deserve to stand there and teach the others within their class. And I hear from their class members, those exact same teachers who think their teachers hung the moon, who think they're like one of the wisest people that they've ever met. And so your, your teachers, those, those people within our church who lead, they need that support. In Philemon 7, Paul is talking about this. He's talking about how encouraging it is to receive and to hear about encouragement. He says in Philemon 7, I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. And so he's hearing about the way that Philemon encourages others and that in turn encourages him. Those who have committed to a place of service commit their time and their energy, and they need that appreciation. They need just to feel how the Lord uh, is using them. And so I want to encourage you to continue to love, support, encourage, send a note of thanksgiving to your leaders in whatever capacity um, they may serve. Number two, one of the ways that we uh, serve others in the church, express that love and care in the community, is to invest, uh, is that one of the reasons is because investing in others' lives benefits you as well as them. Investing in other people's lives, okay, so like giving into other people's lives, whether that's um, a, uh, financially or whether it's just encouragement, whether it's spending time with them, uh, some other blessing in some way. Investing in others' lives benefits you as well as them. Paul says in verse 7 through 8, Don't be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap, because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Now, there's a lot packed into those two verses. And a lot of what is packed into those two verses, we have spent like the last 12 weeks talking about when we were talking about the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit, the bad fruit and the good fruit. Because he's talking about sowing to the flesh and sowing to the Spirit. And so we've already covered a lot of that. But what I want to understand here is that basically that, that idea of what you sow, you will reap, Right? What you sow, you will reap. This is a theme throughout uh, the Scripture, especially in the New Testament. Have you ever noticed how 
good it feels to be a blessing to somebody else? Have you ever noticed that? Even if it's not necessarily within a church context or a, a Christian context or something like that. Um, like if you've ever been somebody who maybe you stopped on the side of the road uh, to help somebody change a tire. You know, you like you get done, your hands are all greasy and grimy and, you know, you're going to get in trouble because you got your suit pants dirty or something like that, you know. But, um, but you just feel good, right? It's like, okay, I helped somebody. I got them, got them back on the road. Maybe serving in a, a soup kitchen, even if it's a secular run, non-Christian based kind of soup kitchen. Like it just feels good to, you, you, you see how gracious people are and how appreciative they are of the, of the little that they have. Maybe it's even uh, uh, serving in some sort of care ministry like agape or care portal or something like that where you get to see on the faces of people a change in their attitude, a change in their outlook because of the hope that they have. It feels good to be a blessing to others. Now, that's not why we do it, right? That's just a separate reward that comes out of that. The Lord is clear, or Scripture is clear, that whatever you sow, you will also reap. And as I said, this is a common theme in Scripture. So Corinthians 9, 6 says, The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. In Luke 6, 38 Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with what the measure you use, it will also be measured back to you. Now I want you to understand, whenever you bless others, whenever you are investing in others' lives, you are going to receive a blessing back. Now it's not always necessarily going to be in the same category, right? Now I wish that I could give you a casserole and you'd give me two casseroles, right? That would turn out well. Uh, I would be very, I know, I know some of you who I would give a casserole to, you would not be grateful, but I most definitely would, right? Um, you'd be like, next time just bring me a Stouffer's lasagna, we'll call it even, um, if I made you a casserole. But listen, it's not about that. It's not like uh, you give $10 to the church, you get $100 back. This is not a marketing scheme or an investment scheme, right? We're not talking about that kind of blessing all the time. Now sometimes, now the scripture is clear, as you give generously to the Lord, as you give sacrificially to the Lord, He's going to meet your needs and He is going to return blessings to you. But it's not always a financial blessing. It's not always a blessing in the same way. God's blessings are multitude. God's blessings are so diverse. We don't want to limit Him to being like, no, I give you A and you give me more A, right? We want to allow the Lord to bless us in multitudes of different ways because there are so many things that come our way that are far more valuable than riches than gold than silver than a, a fat bank account and so give and it will be given to you a good measure pressed down shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap investing in others lives benefits you as well as them and so we need to be generous with our encouragement generous with our care generous with our love among the community because it's almost like it just builds on one another as we're blessing people they're blessing us back and and we're just we're we're growing there in the family together number three one that why we want to uh, be a community that comes together that cares for one another is that churches thrive when we are internally healthy churches thrive they are successful they um, have have health have vibrancy whenever they are internally healthy Galatians 6, 9 through 10 says, Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially those who belong to the household of faith. When we are internally healthy, when that, those blessings are being sown into our church body, our church family, encouraging one another, then our church will begin to thrive. You know, as you feed yourself good food, your body naturally begins to feel healthier. Um, you know, I, I can tell the difference between a day, like the, the, whenever I'm trying to go to bed at night, I can always feel a difference if I've had like a good healthy salad that day, you know, maybe some lean meats or something like that, versus I went to the never-ending pasta bowl at Olive Garden, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like when I go to bed after the never-ending pasta bowl, there's a knot this big in my stomach, you know, and I'm just like, oh, I feel miserable, you know, got heartburn, got all kinds of stuff, I can't go to sleep. But whenever you feed yourself good food, you feel good, right? Well, whenever we are feeding our body good things, our church body good things, we're feeding our body encouragement, we're feeding it care, when we're feeding it spiritual nourishment one to another, not just from the pulpit on a Sunday morning or from the lectern in a classroom, but when we're feeding each other spiritual encouragement throughout the hallways, throughout the weeks, through text message or calls or get-togethers or coffee, we thrive when we are internally healthy. 
Acts, in Acts 16, 4 through 5, um, there's a, there was a time in the, Roman, in the early church when there was division among the church on whether people had to follow the Jewish law in order to be a good Christian or whether they were free under the, the law of grace, when, you know, under the, the, the uh, gift of grace of Jesus Christ, if they were free to not have to follow all of the rules and regulations of the, of the uh, Jewish law. We talked about that early in this study in the book of, uh, in the book of Galatians. But because of that discussion, they had a big meeting in Jerusalem in, in uh, Acts chapter 15, and they got together, Acts chapter 16, uh, 15, yeah, they got together and they began to discuss, you know, what's the, what's the deal? Do we have to follow the law or we don't? And they decided, no, as long as you are under, the, under grace, under belief through faith in Jesus Christ, then through the power of the Spirit, you will fulfill what, is, uh, what the obligation is. That's basically what they decided. But then they decided they need to go back and encourage the church and settle this matter among the churches. So Acts 16, 4 through 5 describes this. As they tra- it says, As they traveled through the towns, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem for the people to observe. So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. As they got together, they discussed the matter. They came to a conclusion, and then they let that answer be known to all the churches. The churches were encouraged. They received that blessing, and because of that, they were strengthened in in the core of those individual churches. And so the church all throughout the Roman Empire was strengthened as they were encouraged by these believers. Church health is an essential aspect of being able to fulfill the purpose God has for us. Todd Wilson, in his commentary on Galatians, wrote, While we would like to avoid the mess and enjoy deep and intimate community, God says that it is in the very process of working through the mess that intimacy and true community is found. It'd be nice sometimes to be able to avoid some of the messy parts of being a church, right? It would also be nice to avoid some of the messy parts of being a parent, right? How how many of you would love to have been a parent and never had to change a diaper? I mean, that would have been a good thing, right? Right? Never have to discipline your kids. Like you have a, a robot over here that disciplines your children. All you get to do is like give them gifts, give them candy and stuff like that. Oh, so basically you'd like to be born a grandparent. It's kind of what you would, like, you would like to happen. But listen, you have to get into the mess in order to raise your kids and, and nourish your kids and help them become a functional adult one day, right? Well, listen, as a community, as a part of the community, we have to get together, get into the mess and help our community thrive. And this bleeds right into the community around us because, number four, we see that communities thrive, outside communities thrive, when the churches thrive. And so our world, our, our city, our state, our nation, our, our world will thrive when churches thrive. Go back to verse 10. It says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially those for who belong to the household of faith. A part of working for the good of our community is working for the good of our churches. Whenever we have healthy churches that will allow our community to thrive even more so. Theodore Roosevelt said, in this actual world, a churchless community, a community where men have abandoned and scoffed at or ignored their religious needs, is a community on the rapid downgrade. I was pretty impressed that I found that quote from him. And, um, but it says, a churchless community where men have abandoned and scoffed at or ignored their religious needs is a community on the rapid downgrade. We need to make sure that as a church, we are uh, seeking to be healthy so that our mission can be carried out in a healthy way and so that our community can be blessed, can be nurtured by the health that they receive from our, see in our church. The early church, we see how they cared for one another and then how that made an impact on their community in Acts chapter 2. And this is after the, Peter has preached his message on the day of Pentecost, and many have been added to the church, and it's kind of describing what happens after that. It says in verse 43, everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. You see, as they 
met together, as they were in awe of what God was doing, as they listened to the preaching of the word, as they uh, shared fellowship together and showed the Lord's Supper together like we're going to do today. All those things built up the health within the church. And as the church was built up, as it became stronger and healthier, and as they praised the Lord through that, it says that they enjoyed the favor of all the people. The community was blessed because of what was going on inside the church. So church family, as we think about this, as we think about what it means to be a, a group of people who are committed to the work of the Lord, a group of people who are working together for the sake of the gospel, as Christians who are called to love all people and to carry the message of the gospel, but also especially those within our Christian community, we need to understand that a part of that, a part of our mission is caring for one another. And we're going to celebrate together here in just...